This is Desiree Hevero, and she lives here. You're looking at the SS Red Oak Victory. It's the last known surviving vessel built during World War II at the Richmond Kaiser Shipyards, located in the San Francisco Bay Area. In this video, I'm taking you inside the Red Oak, and you'll meet the woman who lives on this historic carrier ship turned museum. You'll learn about its history, as well as how and what it's like to live here completely rent free. Desiree is a shipkeeper who lives aboard the SS Red Oak. It's a volunteer role that requires her to be responsible for routine maintenance, basic security, and oversight of the ship. We rely purely on donations and people having events and patronizing those events, and it's all volunteer driven. There's no paid positions on this, on this ship. Right. So when I'm pulling up buckets of water from a leaky winter, that's for love. Born and raised in Richmond, Desiree's become an unwitting historian of sorts for her hometown. Before living on the Red Oak, she previously worked as executive director of the Richmond Museum Association, and she also served as the innkeeper at the East Brother Light Station. More on that later. As a person who lives on an old warship, it's safe to say that Desiree doesn't live a very conventional life. And when you spend a little time with her, you'll come to understand exactly why. I've not been a normal person my whole life. So it works out for me not living a normal life. I mean, I went to community college when I was 14, skipped high school. Uh, you know, um, I've never been a normal person. If somebody says weird, that's a compliment to me. But I've always been adventurous and curious. I think I want to have a life that is filled with so much. Um, I did this or I wondered about this and, and figured it out, or I wanted to do this and made it happen. I want my book to be so full. And the more unique, the better. Desiree's path to calling this former Allied Forces supply ship her home wasn't an obvious straight line. My background's actually in dentistry. I'm very far off the course by now. Uh, I'm licensed in all of that. I specialize in orthodontics. Um, I wanted to have not regular hours, not regular Monday to Friday, nine to five situation. I went to Burning Man in, in 2013, and I was like, I cannot go back into a structured cage. Little by little, Desiree decided to leave dentistry behind. She started doing business around Richmond, and among the things she did was join a few local boards, volunteering her time, skills, and resources. One of the boards that I joined was for East Brother Light Station. Uh, I had always had a feeling somehow just drawn to that place. I, I can't describe it in any other way. It was like a magnet. I had to be there. For a little more than a decade, Desiree tried her luck at becoming the light station's innkeeper. When the position would open up, she'd apply for the job, but each time the circumstances wouldn't work in her favor. That is until 2020. COVID changed some of the math into variables, and then it worked. The business that I was running, Visit Richmond, that business closed because second to healthcare, tourism took the biggest hit. So I was getting a severance package. Um, the in-law unit that I was living in, the, the whole house sold. I got like a relocation offer. I got these two really large checks in the same week that I moved onto the light station. The universe was like, listen, you're not gonna be able to work. Here's some money. Here's what you've always known that you were gonna have even better than you thought you were gonna have it. Because I didn't have to run the B&B. I just got to live there. Desiree wound up living at East Brother Light Station for 14 months, two of which were without power. A story for another video that maybe I can make with Desiree at some point. Let me know if that's something you'd wanna see down in the comments. Then she got a call from my old board, the RMA, and they said, you know, we need, we need a shipkeeper. Would you be interested? I said, on the Red Oak? They said, yeah. Hell yeah, I'd be interested. <laughs> That's my ship. I, you know, I, I took my daughter there growing up. I love that ship. 
and uh, I got that same room that I had been in and it was all just like, it just kept being these full circle loops and it was just undeniable that it was destiny. The SS Red Oak was built in just 87 days at Richmond's Kaiser Shipyards during World War II. The shipyards pioneered techniques like assembly line production, which significantly reduced the time and labor needed to build these wartime ships. They also played a critical role in breaking racial and gender barriers, drawing huge numbers of women and minorities into the workforce. There were four shipyards in Richmond. This is shipyard number three. The other three have been developed over. This is the last remaining of the historic shipyards. Um, Richmond produced 747 ships for the war effort. This is the last surviving ship that we know of. The ships either got sunk or sunk in different, you know, excursions. Like this one's also been to Vietnam, that sort of thing. The Red Oak is a victory ship, which is a kind of cargo ship built to be less vulnerable to enemy attacks. You see, victory ships were capable of speeds of up to 17 knots or about 20 miles per hour, which made them more evasive and faster than their predecessors. So this is the stern of the ship. You see the one rudder mm -hmm. and the propeller. Now, where you see the tip of that cannon coming out um, used to be where the spare, spare propeller was, essentially like the spare tire, and that's right behind you. We moved it for the cannon because the cannon's a little cooler when the guests are here. Yeah. <laughs> but if you, can, if you can imagine, if something happened to the propeller out there on the water, they gotta wait for the conditions to be right, for the wind to be right, for the waves not to be right and get the spare propeller down and swap it out. I mean, changing a tire is hard enough for some people that m imagine. So here you've got your wheel. Um, you've got your navigator shouting coordinates to mm -hmm. you from this window. You've got someone in the gyroscope shouting to you through the screaming tube is what I call it. And you would hear it come out of this horn. This does not come out at that horn. This comes out at a different horn. But in the gyroscope room, if somebody said, three degrees part, it would come out of that horn. Oh, wow. And he would hear it. Wow. So this goes to a different, this goes to the flybridge. The Red Oak served primarily as an ammunition carrier during the Second World War, supporting the Pacific Fleet for major battles, including the invasion of Okinawa. And as Desiree alluded to earlier, in later years, the Red Oak was used to transport military cargo and supplies to American forces fighting in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Now I'm gonna take you to, aside from my own personal space being my favorite because it's mine, All right. I'm gonna take you to my favorite place on the ship. Okay. Okay, it'll be kind of dramatic if you stand right here. Okay. We have our own movie theater. Oh my gosh, this is massive. <laughs> this is just one of the holds. So this was a carrier uh, and a hold holds things. For World War II, this carried ammunition. So essentially a floating target, because if the enemy could take this ship out, it cripples our ammunition supply. Mm -hmm. um, for Vietnam, it had grain, food, cargo, and this is, this is one of the holds, this is hold three. We turn this into a movie theater and we play old movies like Casablanca and that sort of thing. I used to know this guy who was an IT tech, and he showed me what cable I would need to just hook my laptop up to the projector so I could watch Netflix. Oh, right. <laughs> at my movie. So theater. this is where you go and watch movies, like you come down here. How, I mean, why wouldn't you? Yeah, why I would, wouldn't you? Yeah. If you had this, like I am fortunate enough to have. Now we're gonna do an interactive component that's gonna be your favorite. Okay. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna show you how to do it and then you're gonna do it, okay? Okay. All right, so you're gonna get your shoulders into here and hold on. You wanna get some good leverage so that you can shoot an airplane out of the sky. Am I holding this correctly? Yep. Oh, wow. Oh, that's pretty, that is heavy. Yep, and there's one over there too. 
If need be, could these be like loaded with active rounds and could you shoot I think bullets from there? right now, no, because of all this rust. I think there could be a big problem and you don't want to risk injuring yourself. I think if they cleaned up all the rust and oiled it all right and you know did all the testing, yeah, I think it could. Everything else on this ship that doesn't get rusted out still works. After its service following the Vietnam War, the Red Oak was transferred over to the U.S. Department of Transportation's Maritime Administration in 1968. As part of the National Defense Reserve Fleet in the Sassoon Bay, it was mothballed, which is a process of maintenance to prevent deterioration of a ship in case it needs to be reactivated for duty. She was in the mothball fleet in Sassoon Bay, and someone contacted the Museum Association and said, I think we've got one of your ships. So in the 90s, uh, there was a great effort to get this ship back home. Uh, where she was born. And she actually used to be parked right over there in front of the Riggers loft. But when that rented out for the winery, they, they you know, they wanted the view and I don't blame them, right? Yeah. So we just parked her around the corner <laughs> into um, birth five. Now, there was so much history I learned from Desiree when she showed me around the ship. It was very hard to figure out what parts of her tour to keep and what to cut. So if you're interested in seeing more, I've got a link to the raw footage of the whole tour experience, which you can see by signing up to my email list. Just click the link right here on the screen to sign up. So what's it really like to live on a 450 foot long cargo ship? Well, unique might be an understatement. Here we have our original state of the art, not vintage stuff. Electric stove, yeah. This is GE. I, I, I use this to cook when I cook. Okay, you're not using this thing right here. Oh God, no. <laughs> you're not making like hamburgers here on, this the, takes on the grill? So this is my mess, the officer's mess. Note the fans. So I cook in the galley, then I bring it up the stairs and <laughs> I can eat it here. <laughs> this is a funny thing that I learned when I moved on here. So say you want to unlock this, right? You're thinking you're going to turn the key to the left, right? Nope. You have to turn it like you're locking it for it to open. Oh, That's wow. Right. <laughs> this is my bathroom. Or as we call it on a ship, this is the head. This shower is so small that if I need to get a really good shower, I have to do it like this. I have to wash my hair like this. Maybe shave my legs like this. I have to shower in pieces. Wow. <laughs> and warm is a very generous word. Um, is it lukewarm? It's lukewarm. <laughs> That's as, as warm as it gets. There's one water heater and it's down on the lower level. So by the time it gets up here, there's just, yeah. Also, when I first moved in, this was one of the standard spring-loaded up toilet seats that always stays up. Mm -hmm. Because on a ship for men in the 40s, three times out of four, having it up saved you time. That's what was needed, no problem. But when you're a girl, you know, having to put it down and strategically get on it before it would like <laughs> come smack me in the ass, you know? Yeah, a lot um, of timing involved with that. I so you, to, you were able to replace that. Uh, it took weeks and weeks. The guys were always like, well, Sil doesn't complain about that. And you know, and then it's going on. And, I hope it's okay. and this is my cabin. Okay. Really wanted to girly this place up because it's harmless in that kind of old man way, but there's a lot of um, misogyny on this ship. Yeah. You're not changing an 80 year old man's ideas. He'll play along with mostly PC kind of thing, but it's just, it is what it is. It shouldn't be, but it is. So I extra girly this room up mm -hmm. <laughs> in silent protest. Typically, when I'm getting ready to go to bed, there's a like a whole process. So I'll turn this light on because I've got to turn this light off. 
and take my shoes off. There's lots of um, dust and bits and stuff all over the ship, so I wait till the last minute to take my shoes off, which was a really hard thing to get used to. At the light station, I never wore shoes. Oh, really? So then I came here and I had to wear shoes. You don't have like house slippers or anything like that? I've got that. those flip flops. Oh, the flip flops right like there for. In the middle of the night, if I to have to, to the hit bathroom. the head, because yeah. it's all the way down the hall. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I have to wash my face or brush my teeth or whatever, and then I'll turn that light on and that light off because when I'm up here, I can't reach that one. I'll take my glasses off, put them on this shelf. <laughs> Listen to some ASMR on my YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Getting to see a slice of Desiree's life on the ship was a treat for me to experience. It definitely felt like a fun and fascinating place to live. But we all know that no home is 100% perfect. And there are definitely some challenges that Desiree's had to overcome while living there. For starters, summers can get pretty hot. That ship is pure metal. Okay, so it is hotter than it is outside and it doesn't cool off until about midnight, one o'clock. I can't get to sleep when it's that hot. When it's raining, having to find all the leaks and stick buckets around and then wake up every couple of hours to dump the buckets because if they overflow, then it defeats the purpose of the buckets and you still have water that you've got to now clean up. So not consistently sleeping through the night, that's a challenge. In spite of these inconveniences, there's no question that Desiree feels totally grateful to have such an unorthodox place she can call home. The best parts, while well, you were there, the ship itself is the best part of the ship. I mean, that, that's one of the coolest things ever. Are there ever any moments where you get a little bit lonely when you're just out there by yourself? No, no, I'm not lonely, I'm so, aware that these opportunities are not forever. I absorb every moment. I'm, I'm happy to be in those moments. I barely left the light station because any minute that I lost was a minute I wasn't gonna get back. That was a finite time. I mean, I hope the ship's forever, but I'm not foolish enough to think that it is. Nothing's really forever. Um, so I don't get lonely because I'm busy living in the excitement of this really golden period of my life. Now, maybe the other reason Desiree doesn't get lonely on the Red Oak is because it's not the only place she calls home in Richmond. You see, Desiree actually only lives part-time on the Red Oak. She happens to live somewhere else in Richmond, another one of the city's historic landmarks, in fact. And just like the Red Oak, it's another dream come true for Desiree and a place she gets to live completely rent-free. Find out how and where in my next video here on World of Nuance. And in the meantime, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like button, share the video with a friend, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks so much for watching. I'm John Santiago. I'll see you next time on World of Nuance.